Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. From the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, I'm Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer. David Goss, Matt Doyle, Takito, or General Sao. I can never tell. I don't know which one it is. But in the background, our feline friend. Big show coming up. Huge show. CCL review. A huge two-legged series win for the New England Revolution who didn't have to play a single game in doing so. Tati fuels NYCFC's victory. Montreal experiences free space. It was inevitable. And we're going through three more teams today as our season previews wrap up. Enter Miami, complete with an interview with Chris Henderson as he rebuilds this squad just two years after expansion. We'll also talk Toronto FC. Bob's going to play the kids, we think, or maybe he has to, in Charlotte FC. Are they screwed? Are they not screwed? Is it somewhere in between? We will discuss that and then rank our top five number nines. And we start this show with a headline, breaking news. It turns out David Goss is not a man of the people. I repeat, not a man of the people. He is of the upper crust. He looks down his nose at the NYCFC Forever podcast. I heard a story the other night, Dave, and you're looking all incredulous at me. Let me jog your memory real quick. You were in the Rockaways. You were at a grocery store. An enterprising podcaster came up to you. Dave came up and said, will you be on the show? You were jacked. You were all about it. You were doing your New York thing. But then you never came on. You ghosted the when New York I City Forever on? podcast. I don't know, man. They said you ghosted them. How could I ghost something I wasn't invited to? All right. He said they, they said you were that you ghosted them. That's all I know. It's too al- this alternate history from you right now. I like to see I'd like to see some sources here. It sounds like you're reporting based off nothing. No, my sources, are, my sources are the NYCFC Forever podcast. So that sounds, a del- like, that sounds a like delightful a chat source. with. And it sounds like you are not a proper reporter in this scenario. I don't know. This, sounds, this sounds like Rashomon, really. It's like this, it's one thing happens, and it's just like one point of view, perspective on what happened, and then another. And like We'll probably never get to the truth, but I do agree with the overall sentiment from whatever that podcast is that you are clearly not a man of the people. How do you respond? This is your right? opportunity. You're in front, you're at the dais. You've you've been you there's an accusation that has been leveled against you, David Goss, who many people would say are closest to the people among the yeah. folks on this show. So what I would say is on this show, which obviously I hold so dear to my heart, you've got Andrew Weeby who will say anything to anyone to <laughs> be brought true. closer to them. So <laughs> Weeby is attempting to be a fan of <laughs> every team. True. And you've got Doyle who will say anything to anyone <laughs> for them to hate him. And Weeby is not an, Doyle's an enemy of all teams. So therefore, my number one responsibility as part of this show is to remain neutral and I can't be a part of team specific pots. You're a chaotic sorry, neutral. Man. You're definitely yeah. a chaotic neutral. I'm no. a good yeah, I mean, anything, I'm a, I'm a good neutral. That, no, Gasman is like lawful neutral. Like there's nothing chaotic about him at all. He's just playing it straight down the middle every straight single time. Down the middle. Time. Yeah. yeah. Right right down the middle. All right. All right. Well, you know what? We'll we'll let the NYCFC Forever folks respond. I had a great time uh chatting with them. It was uh it was really you know, Jonathan Sanchez, who's gotten more airtime in this show than he deserves. And shout out to you, Jonathan. You're still the man. <laughs> Has been in my mentions as we know for a long time. Finally did it. I really enjoyed it. By the way, you see right now if you're watching on YouTube, uh, that we are wearing the New kits that came out, at least uh, Doyle and I. I got this new LA Galaxy with the sweet collar. Really love the collar design on this uh, right here with the Galaxy, with the Quasars. Really enjoy this. We'll go straight on the shrine over here to my right when we're done. And this is the first time I've ever seen Doyle in a MLS jersey. How do you feel, Doyle? Pretty fit. I think I'm going to hit the gym after this. Uh, I I will say that... uh, these are maybe more flattering on professional athletes than they are on middle-aged guys who are trying to lose that last 15 pounds. But uh, all in all, I'm not not too displeased. You know, it's good motivation ahead of, of ahead of bikini season. This is yeah, really good look, motivation. The, the to, Sounders checkered board really like slims you down. You know, I mean, yeah, like, you, it the, 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 you can't. You, I can't even. Nobody's going to look at the love handles when you got that going right, right. down the middle of the shirt. I'm glad. I'm you glad got, the checkerboard is doing that because nothing else I have tried has actually slimmed <laughs> me down. So. I just love the Doyle classic hat with the beard. You look like a Sounders fan. You look like you are playing the Sounders fan right now. Fight and win. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. I did not see that coming. That's good. MLSstore.com for all the new kids. 
Uh, and if you'd like to cosplay as a Sounders fan, just go pick up a Page Boy hat and a. a oh, I gotta get an IPA. I'll be right back. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> the hoppier, the better. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, if you haven't already checked the feed, you may have seen it. May got the the alert or whatever. We had a nice sit down with Josie Altador that came out this week. Really fun. He opened up, talked about all manner of things, whether it be uh, the move to the Revs, what he was looking for in his next club, whether or not he wants to be on that World Cup team, whether he dreams about that. Uh, whether he can play on turf. like That's a big question that he doesn't seem too concerned about. We'll see about that in practice. Uh, the marriage to Sloan and how his life has changed in the last couple of years. What went wrong in Toronto and what the hell went down in that tunnel in 2017 against the Red Bull. So go check that out. Uh, we'll try to do more of those interviews. If you have somebody you want us to talk to, hit us up. 401 less extra time at soccer.com or hit us up on Twitter at Extra Time. Uh, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. Uh, let's see. CCL first or MLS News first? Choose your adventure, guys. Where do you want to go? Let's start with CCL. Okay. Uh, Rebs, look, I, I sort of teased it already. I mean, Cavalli, unfortunately, really a bummer, not able to get the visa process done. Uh, with help from the Rebs, with help from the Federation, it just didn't happen. We live in weird times, I guess. Uh, so the Rebs move right along. They don't even have to play a game. There's no warm-up for them. They're straight on to the quarterfinals. Uh, NYCFC, though, Doyle, was it a statement that they made? I mean, they went down to, to Costa Rica, went to San Jose. Santos, their stadium is not approved to be played in, so they played three hours down the road. Uh, 2-0 win, Tati times two. That's the way you draw it up. Yeah, it, it, in a lot of ways it was, right? Because it, it, it's a it, smaller Costa Rican team. Like this, this Santos de Guapiles, uh, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Like this is I not... That sounded this good. Is not, Alajuelense, this is not Herodiano. Um, like they had it just kind of a hat, you know, just happy to be here kind of vibe. Uh, and NYCFC took care of business. They did it despite missing a, a couple of starters, uh, despite a red card, despite some slop in, in midfield and playing out of the back. Like it very much looked like their first game of the year. Uh, but they went down to Costa Rica and they handled. Uh, a Costa Rican team uh, with, with with ease. And yes, it's a smaller Costa, Costa Rican team. There are asterisks to throw on this if you want that. That said, um, MLS teams don't traditionally do that. You know, and even, even Liga MX teams struggle uh, in these situations. Like Cruz Azul only beat Forge 1-0. You know, so like this is a... Pumas drew with Saprissa. Right. So... It, it's obviously, I, I think Forge is a, is a measure smaller than this Costa Rican team, and uh, Saprissa is probably a measure too bigger. Uh, but like, it, it gives you an idea of what it is to get results on the road in CCL, and uh, for for NYCFC to to post a a two nil that could have been four if if the woodwork wasn't so weirdly unkind. Um, it it gives you an idea of of what this team can do. And I think if you're an NYCFC fan, you should probably come out of that happy with just about everything except the red card. And the bunch big- of reporting, by oh. the way, on Tati, that, that River Plate put in a final bid and NYC said no. I think the bid reported was $11.5 million. ESPN's reporting this uh, for 50% of his rights. And the report was NYCFC said, well, it's got to be three thirteen point five or nothing. But anyway, it seems like he's going to sign a new contract reportedly. And then they're going to look to the summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. So this is a good start Didn't for him. He signed a new contract about, last year. I, I don't know. They he just if they want to keep him, I guess. But when you have this interest like this, and you know, he's got to say no to River Plate. I guess he's going to say, "Show me the money," and I, I get that. Does he Makes become sense a DP to me. if he signs another new contract? I feel like he's is he already a DP? No, he's not already a DP. I'm sure this new contract would be DP. He's obviously DP caliber. Yeah. Um, like I, there's no downside here for NYCFC to to pay him out like one of the best players in the league, which is what he is. Keep him happy for this year. Keep him happy for this CCL run. Maybe you end up making uh, maybe you end up making the Club World Cup, which would be amazing. That's one. And two is if you have him happy and making three million dollars a year and bagging goals in MLS on a long term contract, that means this summer you don't say 13.5 million for 50 percent you say give me 25 million for 75 percent you have that kind of leverage so it's you know it i have no problem with this i think this is this is exactly what they should be doing tati is worth the money he showed it again the other night like this is not a complicated thing 
I also want to just throw it out there, and if you haven't gone and read uh, Tom Bogert's pieces on both conferences, breaking down DP spots, availability in those, then U22 usage, you should go do that. I literally just went over to the site and then pulled that up so I could jog my memory here. Uh, NYCFC has three U22 players. Doesn't matter if they move Tati up to DP status because they have Tyus Magno on a young DP deal within that. I think both, certainly Maxi, who's also technically a DP right now, or a question mark, he's tamable. So that would allow you then to move Tati up. You would have to do some different things, I would assume, with the cap situation to get you to, to, to compliance if you don't have the salary, uh, the the room already. But it would seem like they do have the flexibility should they want to well, do. That while you were doing part. that, I researched, spent a ton of time on the scenario in which Melbourne City wins the Asian Champions League. NYCFC <laughs> wins CCL. Manchester City wins Champions League. What does FIFA do? Is this Open Cup rules where you can't play a team you own? I don't know. Didn't Yokohama Marinos? Isn't that where Tiago Martins came from? And isn't I don't that know a city? If they're a qual. Yeah, they are, but I don't think they're in. They don't have an opportunity City. to qualify. Yeah, I don't. Don't know. they? And Either doesn't, way. Man, doesn't Man City have a have a Uruguayan club? Oh, I'm is wrong. That? Yokohama is in Champions League as well. Yeah. Oh, do, let's go. They do have a Uruguayan team. Montevideo. CFG Club World Cup, just get them all yeah. involved, baby. We're all going. That's the way it works. Okay. How about uh, how about Forge? You want to talk Forge, Dave, or do you want to talk Montreal, or uh, both? We can talk both. I thought Montreal. Obviously, they get the goal early. It's like super exciting, and then VAR kind of got the goal correctly used. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a foul. Uh, unfortunately, so it is very early a, in the a, play. Yeah, but it, but is, it is where they turnover. win the ball to go the yeah. other way, and like he didn't get the he didn't get the ball. He kicked the dude's leg out, and it was a you know yeah. I don't know. But otherwise, there was a few moments of scramble um, for Montreal. One of them comes off a slip from Joel Waterman, which I don't think there's any blame there. Um, otherwise, I think you saw a pretty compact, a pretty comfortable Montreal team on the road. 1-0 doesn't end the tie for you, uh, although it's heartbreaking and it's classic CCL in every way it happens. Of Your best defender gets magged in the dying moments and then an oddly defect, deflected cross gets headed in at the near post. All of that's brutal, but you're looking at a Montreal team that didn't have a ton of depth in this game. There were not a lot of options off the bench for them. They're playing a winger at one fullback and then, um, you know, converted fullback on the other side. So it, this was, I thought, a strong performance for Montreal to just show at this stage in preseason that they were capable of playing at that level. And then on the flip side for Forge, really unfortunate goal to give up. But you guys mentioned it. They lose 1-0 to the second best team that right now in Mexico and reigning champions for a team that's never been on this stage before with a lot of new pieces that's also in preseason. I thought that was a pretty good performance for them as well. Uh, Leon, 2-0 winners against Guastatoya. Uh, Pumas and Saprisa, we mentioned there, 2-2. Crazy game, uh, good game between those two. Christian Bolaños, two goals, just throwing it back. What year is it? No idea. Christian Bolaños <laughs> scoring goals for Saprisa and CCL. Uh, two more games to go in the first uh, leg of the round of 16. Those are both tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern, Comunicaciones and the Rapids, and then Motagua and Seattle Sounders at 9 p.m. Eastern. We won't obviously talk too much about those, but those are big games for MLS clubs to try to get but, through. But Rebs? Wait, wait, wait. What are acceptable results in those games? Both those, both the MLS teams are on the road. What do you guys think are acceptable results? A win. I think, personally. I think, we're, I think we should be at the point where the expectation, uh, certainly for the Sounders, is to win. And I think given what Colorado did last year, uh, I, I think it sh- I think it should be win, but probably if we're saying truly acceptable, like you're not going to get upset about it. It's not great. It's not bad. It's somewhere in between. Like yeah, I mean, uh, a goal draws with away goals. Yeah, yeah goal scoring goal, tie. Yeah, yeah, would be the key for both of them to just be in a in the driver's seat coming back. And yeah, as long as you win the tie, I don't really care about what the specific results or performance is in the first leg on the road in your first game of the season. But it's it's nice of you, Doyle, to celebrate uh, opening day for the Sounders in the way that you have. I, I know that it's, I know that today is a big day for you. You, you know, you, you've just been waiting all Life, winter. Lifelong just, Sounders fan. You know, just, he actually just, just, just finished his paper mache uh, bust of Jordan Morris that he's been working on all off season. You gonna have the two stick at the bar tonight, or uh, always do, always do, my friend. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, let's uh, let's hit some preseason headlines. Here's one that might not mean jack, but it might mean everything. Brian White, hat trick preseason against the Galaxy, 4-2 win for the Caps. This goes both ways. One, Brian White is just, he's going to level up even more. Super Saiyan 2022. The other side of it is the LA Galaxy still can't defend, apparently. 
So uh, we'll see how that goes for them. Uh, some news here. Jamiro Montero to San Jose. What do you think, Doyle? We talked about uh, this on the last made, show. Did we? Yeah. 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 I think oh. we I think we talked about it on the last show. I think it makes yeah, a lot of sense. Off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Listen to the Sorry, last show if you want my take. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I thought we did, but I forgot, I guess. Uh, but this I don't think we talked in Listen depth about. Listen to the last show because Weeby obviously didn't anyway. <laughs> yeah. I space out a lot. You know how it goes. Uh, fire are close to signing Jairo Torres from Atlas as a young DP. Paul Tenorio's kind of stringing this one along there was interest he reported now it looks like it's going to be close uh tom bogart confirms that torres is 21 years old he made his senior l3 appearance in 2019 that was his debut he's a product of the atlas academy and that, that academy has a lot of uh good players that have come out of it he's already made 108 appearances across all comps at 21 eight goals eight assists he would be a uh, a winger in ezra's four two three one this seems like a this seems like a good ambitious signing uh for the fire it seems this seems positive, like a big step forward. They need a winger. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and we've talked about the trying to tap into the Mexican community there. Obviously, Cuadrac Blanco was a huge part of that when he was there and the energy that it had around it. So a lot of this makes sense for a player in Torres who's maybe hit his ceiling in Mexico. And in the past, the decision would be, do you go to Chivas? Do you try and push into uh, Monterrey or one of those two teams or America? And now maybe MLS comes into this conversation, especially when you see uh, Julian and and, uh, and David Ochoa and Efra getting opportunities with the Mexican national team. It doesn't disqualify you to come to MLS. And if you're going to spend a DP spot on this player, there's value there that you're probably going to give him opportunities. And it's position of need for Chicago. So it'd be cool if they got a move like this done. Um, it sounds like it's pretty far away still. So maybe wouldn't be for the start of the season. TBD, we shall see. Sporting KC got a number nine. They've been looking. They've been talking to a lot of people. They went through the Robert Barrett reentry thing. They were apparently in for Josie out the door. Uh, there were a lot of solutions that they tried to figure out, and they end up in uh, in Serbia, I believe, with a Montenegrin number nine. I Nikola Vucinovic is. A, I they don't have the pronunciation guide on the press release, and that is a bummer for me. But uh, he's on loan. He is, I want to say, 25, Doyle? I mean, I think yep. we can all just raise our hand and say we don't know anything about this guy. Yeah, I mean, he, it seems like he's on the, the fringe of, the, of that national team. He, he's having a, a nice year in, in that league. It's not a dominant year. Um, it's it's very much a, a wait and see. It feels like a Band-Aid, um, but it, it might end up like guys have looked like Band-Aids before and come in and, and been much more than that uh, and, and – you know, Peter Vermees has a pretty good track record of, of recruiting players from that part of the world. Uh, so, I mean, we'll see. Yeah, it seems to me like they were in a, they, look, they were in a desperate scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had to figure this out. Zoran Savage is an assistant coach there. He is uh, he's from Serbia, what was then Yugoslavia back in the day. So I assume they went to their personal networks and they were like, all right, let's just – we got to get somebody. This is going to be a striker by committee situation with Kyrie. Here you go. He's available. He's having a decent season. Maybe we can get more out of him uh, in this league than otherwise. How about Dom Dwyer to Atlanta United? Deal done. Switches sides <laughs> in the rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> Knew I was going there, right? No, Knew I, I didn't because I actually honestly forgot uh, like, he played in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Orlando fans will be heartbroken, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. They're all time two year, two year deal for Dom Dwyer, uh, reported by Jamie Watson to start. I don't know if it's, I think it's official. I don't know if it is yet. Uh, but it seems like it's a very much, it's like loaded with incentives, right? Yeah. Loaded. This, like, this is wait, a, hey, if he, if, it's a player that Atlanta has been looking for, which is just a veteran backup to Joseph. So that if he, if they need to rest him, if he's hurt or any reason, they have someone to fill that role. They've never been able to, to fill that, they tried Kubo Torres and Adam John, and obviously they had Tito Vialba to sort of play in there if they needed to. They've just never had this. So it makes sense from that point of view, and and Dom obviously knows this league. Um, I think there was some hope, obviously, based off the contract we saw in Toronto, that he could be that guy, and he wasn't able to be. So now in Atlanta, you're hoping it goes a little bit better. Hey, and Dom got the buyout, so he got his money, and now he gets an incentive-laden deal to see if he can get his form back as well. It seems like a good risk for uh, everybody involved yeah, there, but it is uh, sort of funny to, you know, I still remember like the 3-3 draw at uh, 
at, at uh, Mercedes Benz that Dom was like the snarling villain in, and now Atlanta United has just taken on all the snarling villains into their team. Uh, Red Bull is officially signed Luquinha, so Minnesota United officially signed Kervin Ariaga, and we are officially what uh, nine days away from MLS opening day next weekend. It's crazy. This is our last our last show of of previews. Wow, we've gone we've gone through twenty five teams so far. We got three left. We'll knock them out today, and then on Monday, I know it's President's Day, and we won't actually tape it that day. But tomorrow, we will get in the uh, laboratory and try to cook up some great stuff for you with our preseason predictions for individuals, all the different extra time award categories that we go through normally. If you have any suggestions for those, hit us up four zero one two zero six zero plus extra time at soccer dot com or tweet at us at extra time. Did you uh, ask got some good ones. about our intro? I didn't. Uh, okay. No, wait. Did I, Anders? I forget what I do on this show. You said we're, we like to cook stuff up, and the first thing that came to me was cook up some good stuff for you. And the, I, I think, think Toronto I think we re released the speech in higher definition when he left, thanking Josie for his time. Oh, really? In higher definition? Wow, in like 4K. I think we talked about it before, uh, and he was. And I think he's okay with us having it's a great it moment. I think it's a good. It's a good moment in his life, Great you know moment. what I mean? Like He might not remember that either. He definitely you know, like, doesn't. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> he might not remember that one either. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's get to it. Oh, by the way, on the on the Extra Time Awards, we are going to do the David Goss Theorem Player of the Year now. So that's an addition. So if you have any additions, let us know on I'm that. officially Inter-Miami. on the show. Ma, look, yeah. I made it. <laughs> Big yeah, yeah, yeah. We still, I mean, we still had Bobby Warshaw when he wasn't on the show since we've changed that. But, yeah, but uh, Inter-Miami, a heavy here we go. Come on. He is. He is. You're, talk, you're talking about a combine MVP, Bobby. He's Morrison. got tentacles all throughout <laughs> yeah. sport in the, in the Americas and beyond. Inter Miami 2021, the haiku. David, Phil, and Chris will trust bring better results. Talking sure didn't. That was a reference to all the talk. Uh, the, the quality of club they were going to be, the players that they were going to sign, the profile that they were going to have. And here we are in 2022 with this haiku. Ahoy! Wrecking ball! Restart the expansion clock. Build it like Beckham. Now, the last line I'm not proud of, but Ooh. I don't know. I don't really know what the last line means, but it, it was five syllables and bend it like <laughs> Beckham was fun. But you, Anders like the hoy. You don't, <laughs> Anders, your, your dad's a seafaring man and you don't know what a hoy is? Come on, bro. Let's go. Get it get it together here. Uh, what is this season for Inter Miami? We'll talk to Chris Anderson about it here in just a little bit, Doyle. But th- this is uh, one of the most interesting off seasons in the history of this league, I would say. Yeah, it's it's almost a complete teardown, um, and I like. I understand why, given the way <laughs> Miami have played over the past two years, and the budgetary constraints that they have um, put themselves up against, uh, and it, it makes it interesting from uh, a roster building perspective. I, I think that. What, what Chris Henderson did in getting Gregory last year and then Jean Mota this year um, is going to end up being kind of a treatise on how important it is to have uh, that central midfield right. Like if those guys are both very good MLS players, then my theory is that it will have a knock-on effect on everything else. And I don't think it would make Miami a playoff team, but... It could make them not bad. And like that seems like the right starting spot. Um, But also, there's no guarantee that they're going to be very good together this year. And there's no guarantee that even if they are very good, the rest of it's going to hold up. Because there are question marks just everywhere on the field with this team. Uh, Which is... To be expected after the first two years that they had and, and the uh, the sanctions against them uh, for their OG roster build. Chris Runkve, defender in, DeAndre Yedlin in, Damian Lowe uh, in, who you'll be familiar with back in the day uh, as an MLS draft pick, and then he was in the union system, didn't make it there, went to Scandinavia, has since had a nice career, plays for Jamaica, good player, good center back. You said Jamota, he's in, Bryce Duke traded from LAFC. Um Really, the, the, it's not the key signings necessarily. It's more like the outgoing, like the whole squad. Just uh, We've talked about it on the show repeatedly. Like They just chop, 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 chop. Like everybody gone. We've got to restart this thing. The star spotlight, Dave, is Gonzalo Higuain. They have one open DP spot, and they have the ghost of Rodolfo Pizarro in their other DP spot. Uh, because nothing came back to them when they loaned him out. Again, they just were having to hit the restart button. They still have him filling that DP spot. 
Uh, Iguain, 30 games, 12 goals, 9 assists last year. That, that's better than I, I remember, you know, like when you try to think back on you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's actually better than I than I thought it was. Yeah, some of those gaming games, they lost by five goals or whatever. So that's part of the memory <laughs> issue, and, and it's easier to score in those moments. But everything you've heard out of Miami is what you want to hear, and, and it's what you hear around a lot of guys at this time of year, but that he's coming in fit, that he's coming in focused, um, and that he understands his role with a young group around him, right? He is he is the lone elder statesman in this group. And, and when you do look at the roster that they've had to pull apart, he is the one player that you say – he is of DP value. And so that's one of the reasons he's the one guy that stuck around when they're handing out other DPs to Philly and to Monterey because he has the ability at 12 goals and nine assists. If you put the team together a little bit better, you're talking about double double and making life easier for these other players. And the way Miami's had to go about this roster build has been what are the mechanisms the league has created that we can get players in against the cap? And not using castaway. So you look at all the under 22s, young DPs, homegrown players, stuff like that. All of that needs someone to lean on. And I think Iguain's expected to be that player. And we've seen it in moments, but we haven't seen it in any consistent form over the cross uh, across his MLS career. And this has to be the year where he does it. Ability is probably not what we question uh, with Gonzalo Doyle. And I honestly can't. I'm not, I'm not saying he's not trying. I'm not saying he's not putting in the effort, but I can certainly understand how he might be, after these two years, frustrated. Like, yeah. beaten down a little bit. Like, I, I, I personally would be. Yeah. So that, that, to me, is the biggest question mark with him. I was like, how can you know, Phil Neville, how can the, the fresh faces in the squad, how can Gonzalo himself find something new as far as sort of a motivation here and a drive after what have been really two miserable years? It's a really good question. Uh, I don't know the answer. And the hope is that Phil Neville does. Uh, and that's his job, right? Like he, He's the coach, and, and he's just as much the coach for the young guys who have never played a big game in their lives and have their whole career ahead of him uh, as he is for you know a legend like Gonzalo Higuain. And, and the, the job is to make sure that these guys find that drive and find that optimism and that hope week after week after week and uh, carve out something better than than what they managed each of the past two years. I like there were times last year where I thought Gonzalo Higuain was really impressive where he was like, you know, he was locked in and he was taking it to teams, but he was also a man on an island. You know, like, like it, and that looked really demoralizing just in, in terms of his body language. Like, you could see every week there was like one particular moment where his soul would leave his body, and that was that. Was that. And like, the, from my hunch is that if Miami played like good, solid team soccer. Nothing flashy, nothing you know, groundbreaking, but just like look like a team. Then he will find what he needs and occasionally elevate the whole thing. Um, I don't know that for sure though. And after what we've seen the past two years, it's a massive if. I'm sitting here listening to you give that answer and looking at Dave, and you know, just just a little bit uh, regretful that we didn't send you both inner Miami jerseys so that we could have a conversation with uh, the Iguains on this show, like just to make sure you get it straight from the man himself. You know, that's that's a real mistake on our part. I have to talk to Anders about that. Uh, Twenty two hundred twenty two player to watch, Emerson Rodriguez. I'm not going to lie to you. We're going to talk to you know, we're going to talk to Chris Henderson here in a second about about some of these guys. I mean, like Campana and etc. They got some young players that they've brought in. Uh, Rodriguez is twenty one year old Colombian. He's going to start on the wing. You think he's got eight goals, eight assists, and fifty five career games in Colombia. So a pretty good uh, little track record for him I don't know I, I have no insight so I'm not going to act like I have any do you guys have any do you want to is there anybody on this team as far as young players that get you excited that, that you're thinking about here maybe we have a mailbag here about uh, Robbie Robinson maybe this is a year for him although I don't think he's 22 or 22 no he's too old now he's, he's turning 24 this year I think Ooh. Um, yeah like it, it's it's tough to find one uh, and, and the hope is that a month into the season, we will be able to give you a better answer. And I think for as a Miami fan, but also if you're talking about like a fan of the league. I think this is an opportunity for a lot of young players to get minutes because this team can't afford veterans. So 
Um, they've talked about their academy. Obviously, it's early, but how great would it be to have a robust academy coming out of South Florida, just in terms of creating talent and what's out there? Um, and then you look at all of these young players that they've brought in. Um, Leo Campana as well. You mentioned Rodriguez, uh, the Finnish winger that they brought in. Like all these guys, this yeah, is a Taylor. huge. This is a huge opportunity for you to like establish yourself like Lewis Morgan did two years ago and become a staple in this club. Uh, they also Felipe Valencia is a 16 year old out of the academy, so he's one of the first uh, first guys that you look to to send, see that little change for them of trying to tap Edison, into South I, I should talent. say Edison Ascona as well. The, yeah, the he's he an, a, an academy kid. He was really good last year. This time last year at. Uh, CONCACAF Olympic qualifying. He played, you know, he's a dual citizen. He's U.S. and, and Dominican Republic. He played for the DR. And he's been capped uh, by the DR. Like, he looked really good. And I th- he was, like, decently productive as a 17-year-old last year in USL. So I guess we found your answer, Weeby. Like, that, I uh, guess he, he's the one I'm, I'm most interested in. And if Ian Frey's coming back from his ACL, I mean, look, they, they've got talent down there. There's no doubt about it. They're just trying to tap into it and figure out how to get there. We'll talk yeah. uh, more about that in the coming months and years, I expect. Here is our over-under, the finish in the East. Andres has set this at nine and a half. So if you're going over, you're not saying playoffs necessarily, but if you're going under, you're definitely not saying playoffs. Where, where do you stand on the over-under here uh, for their finish? Uh, I did my standings finally, so I'm going to look at them so I don't have to guess. I'm doing it afterwards. Nice. I'm so last year, on. I'll just, I'll just, they were 11th last year. So ninth yeah. would put them basically probably within like sniffing, nine and a half would put them like sniffing distance of I the have playoffs. Them well they would under. be in a zone. Yeah. So I have them under. I, I, suge- I suggested the line to Anders in the pre show and I said 10 and a half. And it, if it was 10 and a half, I think I would still take under. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had them 12th, I think, uh, when I did my standing. So there's more hope, I think, than last year for this team, but not by much. <laughs> That's a well-timed buzzer right there. I'm going to take the under as well, and I don't think that that's necessarily an indication of whether or not their season is a success or failure of being under that number. Like they, they're building the foundation right now. Like mm-hmm. they had to, they literally had to dig down six feet under and tear it all out. Like the, they've got to, they've got to get something more than just results, though that'll matter as well. All right, it's an AT&T 5G call to the field. Let's have a chat with Chris Henderson. He's the chief soccer officer and the uh, sporting director at Inter Miami, one of our favorites on the show. It's an at and 5G call to the field. Out to South Florida we go. The chief soccer officer and sporting director of Inter-Miami, Chris Henderson, a friend of the show. We're always glad to have you, Chris. How's it going? How you feeling? Good, Andrew. Uh, great to be here. I, I love coming on the show. Good to see you, David. Um, no, I'm excited. It's going well. We're, uh, we're building things. We're in Charleston right now for preseason. Um, we have our last game of the tournament on Saturday against Charlotte. Have you been to Husk? So far, while in Not while yet. in Charleston. Not yet. I had to break away for a few days for a conference, but uh, I hear it's a good spot. Ah, uh, yeah, you got to go there at lunchtime, even by yourself. It's very worth it. For those of you who don't know about the restaurant, go look it up. It is wonderful. That's the best part about being in Charleston. But let's talk about the off season. Insanity, man. It just feels like it just feels like every day another move, another you know addition by subtraction, and then addition as well. Like, how have you experienced this off season for Inter Miami? Yeah, I'll be happy when roster compliance comes. It's It's been a super busy, uh, exhausting offseason, but um, some moves we felt we needed to make and, and changes within the club and, and going in a new direction. Um, you know, consistency is going to be a big one for us this coming season. Uh, I think we're younger, uh, faster, more dynamic than we were. Uh, and now it's about getting the group together and gelling and, and getting uh, those parts to play well together. Tell me about how the sanctions that you have have affected you. How, how has that changed how you have to go about this uh, remake of, of a roster that was an expansion team just two short years ago, basically? Yeah, I mean, we took it. We took it when we the sanctions came. We took it as one way. We got to move forward. This this is uh, you know where we're at right now, and and how are we going to deal with it? And I think uh, we've been really aggressive. That was our approach. Um, let's deal with it right now instead of dragging it on. And that's why we've made the moves we have. And uh, you know, some of them were some really difficult moves um, into the roster and being able to. Um, create some value to add to our club and and sometimes you have to lose some really good pieces uh, to be able to um, 
you know, get some allocation money, get some resources to make some other moves. And we did that. How would you define what you're doing with this roster? I mean, in my mind, in some ways, I think, okay, well, this is like a, it's almost like a, a complete teardown, like a remake. How do you define it in your mind? I would say bringing players in with a winning mentality, players who um, are going to compete every single day, um, a, a reset kind of of the, the player culture and, and who we are and where we're going. Um, and, and as I said earlier, consistency, uh, being able to be a team that can be consistent um, throughout the season. It's a long season, but it comes fast. And, um, you know, through this marathon, you have to be able to get through things you have to rely on your full roster um i feel like we've added some some depth we have some good young players coming through and i'm i'm really excited about the future uh the talent we have in south florida and what our academy is going to want to bring through our system let's start with one of those new a couple of those new toys you've brought in obviously you're known for your eye for talent what you've been able to do over your time in seattle and Miami, we have Campana, Emerson Rodriguez, Mota. Tell us a little bit about the process of finding and bringing all these players in, as well as what you think they can bring to an MLS team. Yeah, I mean, with every signing, as every club goes through, time will tell whether they were good good signings or not. Um, but, uh, you know, one, I would have to say, recognize the group that I worked with, uh, Nikki Budalich, uh, Mark Prasant, Sam Gregory, Megan Cameron, the work that that group initially has done in the offseason, working together as a team, and then Phil and Jason and the coaching staff, their involvement. Um, adding Emerson Rodriguez uh, from Millonarios, uh, fast, young, attacking, exciting player who can play off the right, uh, will go at players. Uh, Jean Mata is like a playmaker in midfield. He will pair next to Gregory and, um, you know, he can play at the 10. He can play off to the left. He's, he's versatile, super smart, uh, thinks ahead of the game. Um, I think he's going to be able to connect our lines in maybe what we, you know, were missing in the past. But uh, we're excited to add Jean Mata, top player. Um, Campania also. Uh, uh, didn't have to use a foreign spot with him. Good back to goal player um, can help us keep the ball as we're moving forward in attack. Um, you know, at times may may be in a pair with Gonzalo up top, uh, but we have other options there as well. Uh, Robbie Robinson can play next to Gonzalo. Uh, we also have uh, Ariel Lassiter, who's had a good preseason. When you think about the the foundation of this sporting operation, you went and thanked a lot of people that, you know, we talk to GMs all the time. They, they don't often go down the line like that. Help me understand what you feel like you've accomplished in building that out and then the foundation that that gives you going forward. What, what's the most important thing in a group like that, in your opinion? Yeah, I think the last year there was a lot of time spent on the foundation of the club, putting putting pieces in place, making sure we had a good academy director with Craig Dalrymple now, and, and we have a good, clear pathway through the first team, a scouting department, uh, analytics department. Now, uh, this year, we focused on a, a performance department, and it's about bringing trying to bring in the best people and what they do and collaborating together and and just letting them do their job and uh if everyone is doing that and feels the freedom to do their job i, I think that collective um adds for a better better organization all the way through and i feel like we have a really good foundation now to support our first team but at the end of the day it's it's pro soccer and it's about results on the first team so uh you know we get that part right we have everything underneath and surrounding the team to support that but when you look at this team for fans it's the players who are there long term that you know build their identity with the club the players that they get used to supporting you're buying their jerseys who do you look at and say these are the guys that inter miami is built around that will be here that will be a part of success when it comes down the road yeah, I mean, you, you try and build a team and you look at look at the pieces and, you know, you hope players will stay four or five years and you can run with those. You know, Gregory is a great centerpiece to that. Uh, Gene Mota next to him. 
Uh, Iguain is super important this year. He's come in fit. He's a leader of this group. He's like the elder statesman who who gets all the young guys together and uh, they kind of follow his lead. So having his commitment is going to be really important. And then some of the young pieces we've added. I mean, Lassiter uh, isn't young, but he's he he still has something to prove in this league. Um, uh, Rodriguez is a great example of a young player. And then we have we have others who can play in the back. Uh, McVeigh is a good addition. Damian Lowe is a good leader. So I look at the spine of the team. Uh, Marsman in the back. Um, we have a solid spine. And then we're, we're building those pieces around it. A mixture of guys who want the ball under pressure and can, can keep the ball under pressure and um, some fast guys who can stretch teams. So it's a, it's a balance between the two. Is there any emotional scar tissue to work through here, Chris? Like, you know, I'm just thinking of these first two years and all the changes and everything that's happened. Like, you know, for, for a guy like Gonzalo, who maybe had different expectations when he originally signed, for the whole club, it just it feels like there might be a, a different, like a psychological side to get through. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I, the one player I have to add that's super important for the culture and the future is DeAndre Yedlin. Um, uh, I've known him for since he was six years old. So uh, he is going to be really important for us and important for the mentality. And adding those kind of pieces helps the psychology of the team. It helps the the psyche of the group and going into games, knowing we have some guys who are going to give it all, compete, and have a winning mentality. So, you know, I think if you're able to get success with that group of players, then it helps go through the culture of the club. Um, but I feel like we have people committed. They believe in where we want to go. Uh, the ownership support with the Moss brothers, Jose, Jorge, David Beckham, uh, they're completely supportive and behind where we want to go. And, and, you know, I thank them for allowing us to make some of the transactions and the future transactions that we will make to add to this club. How much patience have you had to preach or do you preach with this project? I think it's just trusting in the process. I think that's that's what's important and, and believe that we're building something that has long-term stability and, and uh, that's sustainable. Um, and some of that comes to just one player signing at a time and then being able to get everyone buying into what we're doing as a club. And um, yeah, the pieces are in place and, and sometimes it comes down to the combinations on the field and how players gel and how they how they work together on the field. You mentioned one piece at a time. You have one huge opening in a DP spot still available. Should fans expect to see another DP brought in, whether before the season or this year? We're working hard on that that DP spot, and, and uh, we have some really good options in front of us. Um, people who can come in and galvanize our team and be a catalyst for, for a winning environment and um, – those types of players are, um, it's contagious throughout the group when you bring a player like that in um, who wants to win, who wants to work. And it seems to me that when you do that, the other top players within the team raise their level. And that's what we want. That's what we want to bring in. We want to bring in someone who can be, you know, three, four, five years at the club and change, um, change the, the way the team plays on a daily basis. So obviously every team wants to win MLS Cup. That's obvious. That's easy. That's that's the point. But in your mind or in Inter Miami fans' minds, what should be a win in 2022? What's a successful year? What are things that if you look back, you'll say this we're on the right road coming into coming out of this season? Yeah, I mean, I think consistency. As I said before, we need to be able to compete at a consistent level where, you know, if we, you're going to have periods in the season where you have dips and you have uh, some injuries and you're, you're having to piece things together. But, you know, can you bounce back from those quickly or do you go on a streak of going down? And, and good teams find a way to respond after a poor result. And I think that that would be a big step for me is how we respond in those moments and how we can be over a long period of time. And, and if you can do that, then it puts you in a position to make the playoffs. Then it puts you in a position to advance in the playoffs through your experience uh, experiences that you have during the season. So I, I think it's just it's a matter of building. Can we take a, a really big step forward this year and then continue that going into next year? 
Block by block, that's the way for Inner Miami. Uh, while we have you, Chris, I, I can't resist. I know Andres in the background saying rap, rap, rap. But I got to ask you about the big picture. Your offseason, crazy. This offseason for MLS has been sort of unprecedented in my mind. Do you see it the same way with the level of sales, the volume of sales, the incoming players? Like, Where, in your opinion, is this league right now when it pertains to sort of this world market that we're really pushing into? Yeah, I'm really proud of where the league's at. To, to be a, a, someone who played here starting in 96 to where we are today, I look at it as finally, like finally they're starting to see MLS has players who can play anywhere in the world. And I just think now it's coming really fast. And uh, I just was in a con- transfer room conference the other day and all the clubs were talking about, oh, what's the next market you're looking at? And uh, everyone's mentioning MLS and... You know, some of the Bundesliga clubs, for example, have been looking for the last five, six years at at our young players. So I'm really proud of where we're at now. We will continue to grow really quickly. So uh, as a former player now, now GM, it's it's great to see. All right. We're looking uh, on in Miami very uh, with a lot of interest. Let's put it that way. A big season in 2022. Chris Henderson, always a pleasure, man. Thanks, guys. Just so everyone knows, Chris Henderson ran 14 miles before he sat down for that interview, <laughs> and his heart rate was still at a resting number. That man is in the best shape of any GM in MLS. I'm putting my stamp down on that. I, I should probably like adopt a you know a pre-show routine. Like he has a pre-game routine. Yeah. He used to go to Seattle and like you'd look up in the stands and nobody's there. It's like three hours before game time, and Chris Henderson's just running stairs for like an hour, and then comes out to talk to you. Not even not even a hair not even a hair wrong. No. Not I a mean, drop of sweat. Gonna... Now, I will say I've seen Carlos Bocanegra do similar in Atlanta, mm. and that's a large stadium as well. We're talking two, you know, natural football stadiums. So those guys could go for a race, and we'll see. Yeah, what fortunately happens. for uh, Inter Miami fans, you know, if Chris lives to a hundred, that's a, that's good news for them because this is a long term <laughs> build for them. Uh, okay, sorry, Toronto FC, twenty twenty one, Florida is home. Old legs, new legs. Press is here. Big test for Armis. Whoa. What a time yeah. capsule of a... Yeah, I know. Yeah, you, dig, you know what? Dig the, somebody's going to dig that one up like, you know, a couple decades from now and be like, what the hell is this? That I, what, We got to go check the history books. That's like an afternote right there. Uh, yeah, so things have changed in Toronto. <laughs> so they're 2022 haiku. Time to play the kids. Bob will embrace the challenge. Stars in the summer. I just, I don't think this team right now was like haiku wise was worth getting too clever about. Their depth chart uh, remains quite seemingly incomplete, I would say. Uh, It is a lot of young guys, a lot of academy guys, uh, of various degrees of MLS and first team experience. I mean, Bob is just going to have to play the kids. And in some way, I think that he's going to enjoy that. Um, We know that he is a guy that likes to teach, that likes to be hands on, that likes to work with young players, that likes to see that sort of like rapid improvement. We saw that with guys like Latif Blessing and Mark Anthony Kay. Uh, Edward Atuesta and others in L.A., uh, and that's the way it's going to have to be this year as well. And then in the summer, Lorenzo Insigne comes into a team that you hope is a little more well-formed, uh, that Pozuelo can uh, you know, can kind of drag them along from a creative standpoint until then, but it feels, Doyle, like there are going to be some natural growing pains here. Yeah, I, I, I think that's pretty fair. It is another team, like they haven't gone as complete, a, a rebuild as uh, as Miami, but it's been a lot. Uh, the you know central defense looks like it's probably upgraded. Uh, both fullback slots, uh, real massive question marks at this point. The composition of the midfield: Bradley, Osorio, and Pozuelo, all very good players. Can they cover ground and win the ball? Io coming back. I think they did the absolute absolute right thing uh, in in using their only D, uh, U twenty two slot on him because because I I think he's a potential twenty goal scorer, but he's also gotten hurt each of the past two years. It's not clear who the starting wingers are at this point. Like there are so many questions to answer um, right now. I like it feels like it's too many. I, I don't like this. Does not strike me as a, as a as a playoff team right now. Here's the toughest part too. Let's just say you find those answers and you put it all together and the team is what it is. Then the biggest player on your team comes into the roster in the middle of that. So it's not just one question or it's not one set of questions. You'll have to do it twice no matter what because Insigne is arriving in July. And if they are the best team in MLS, 
then that's going to shake things up. And that seems fairly unlikely. Um, but no matter what, you sort of have to go into this first half of the season with an eye towards how does he then fit in to the rest of this and how do the pieces all fit together. And I think that's really complicated. Uh, and I think it's tough to say that it's going to be hugely successful this year because it's just so much, so many moving pieces over the course of the year. I actually think this is a, I think Bob has an advantage in that sense and that he knows what's coming. He knows you would think when it's coming, like middle of July, maybe late July, depending on how much rest you want to give in senior. And he doesn't have anybody in that spot. It's not like there's going to be somebody at left wing or right wing or wherever they're going to play him that's like locked in. So he can start to build over the course of these months. Like, but are you sure there would that be fits wingers? That guy. But are you sure there would be wingers without him coming? When you look at this team, yeah, would that be the way fair. you line it up? And I think that's the problem is you do have to build it that way that he'll step in when it's not the way maybe the roster's built without him. And that's the question mark that they can't really find. What's Pasuelo's but without him? But without him, they're not a playoff team anyway. So what's like? it's more important to build to what he adds than it is to try to like paper over results and play the way that this roster might be better constructed otherwise. Like Your whole goal is to be at the optimal point to in- integrate Insigne when he gets there. So he elevates you from whatever you were before. And really to get like, I don't know, who is it going to be? Schaffelberg or Petrasso or Jaquil Marshall? To make sure your outside backs and these young guys feel comfortable and confident. But let's get into let's get into it real quick here. The, the signings, obviously, Bob Bradley's the biggest signing here. Shane O'Neill's a signing that's very solid, I think. He'll be depth at center back. Carlos Salcedo is their biggest signing. I like the Jesus Jimenez signing because he's not like, hey, I'm going to be a starter sort of guy. He's sort of a, hey, if things with Io don't go exactly right, maybe we could play two with Io. He seems like more of a creative force, whereas Io could be more of that, that that, like in the box nine, and then in senior, obviously in the summer. Uh, star spotlight is Pozuelo. Pozuelo is going to run more than he has before. <laughs> I think is a safe assumption to make here. I will be watching that very closely. Last year was not his year. He was an MVP, and then he was not an MVP. One goal, four assists in 19 games last year. Doyle, he wasn't healthy. What do we expect from him? Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's it's a Really massive question. I, I think given how Bob Bradley has, has preferred to line his teams up over the past couple of years and what we've seen in preseason, it's a 4-3-3 with Pozuelo not really as a 10, but more as one of those dual eights. Um, as you said, that means more running, more pressing. There will be more defensive transitions, uh, getting pressure to the ball early, winning 50-50s. And these are not necessarily things that you associate with Alejandro Pazuelo. So the argument that is being made with this roster construction is just an argument of, of pure talent. That like more like forget fit, just having more talent is uh is the differentiator i've never been particularly enamored of that argument um and, and i'm not really holding my breath here but like maybe it works cuz he is a talent like he's an mvp caliber talent i just think he's he's limited and you you you, you have to use him in a certain way and it doesn't like it sounds like bob's going to ask a lot more of him than greg vanny ever really did Look at that. Doyle just throwing the tag over his shoulder. Didn't even, didn't even take the tag off. Didn't even <laughs> just, just threw it right on. Oh, man. How about uh, how about Jaquil Marshall Ruddy? Let's do a 2222 player to watch. I, I think they could sell him for a lot of money right now. They haven't, <laughs> which means that they think they could sell him for more later. He hasn't really played first team soccer. Uh, we're about to see it, Dave. This is going to be it. Sounds like he's the right back. How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I think. Toronto has shown in the past um, that there is a pathway to getting into that first team. And it's one of those moves where that's not his natural position. That isn't the position you hope he plays, but it's a way to get him on the field. And I don't think there's a better way to do it than playing alongside Carlos Salcedo, who's going to be as experienced a center back as there is in this league and um, ability to cover ground and and cover behind you. So it's an opportunity there. I I don't think he's going to be the only name we're talking about. Uh, you mentioned it in the high coup. I think Ralph Preso is going to have some minutes to play in this team and bring something to that midfield that no one else does or Noble Akello. One of those two, you've got center forward uh, depth that's coming out through the academy. Jacob Schaffelberg as well. Like This is a team that has talked about using their academy for years, and they've invested in it higher than a lot of other 
clubs around MLS, and they haven't totally gotten the payout outside of Io Akinola. Um, and Bob Bradley's shown his willingness to to teach young players, but also to use them. Uh, and I think that should be exciting for people who I think a lot of TFC fans have been waiting for them to really like activate and tap into this academy. Uh, Jaden Nelson's another guy on the wing. If you're looking for names there, I mean, you could go uh, through half the, academy. the league and, and talk about guys who came out of the or have played in the TFC Academy that don't play for Toronto. Uh, and I think now they'd like to change that a little. What What is a good season from Jaquil Marshall Ruddy? Uh, showing that he can play at a professional level. Yeah. Um, so getting ten to fifteen starts in MLS would be a huge year for him. Um, so yeah. If you talk to European scouts about like who's who's the best young prospect in MLS, who's the best teenage prospect in MLS, it, it's unanimous that it's Jaquiel Marshall Ruddy. So yes. I, I think uh, like ahead of Gaga Slonina, ahead of I don't know Moses Nyman, ahead of all like all of these kids who deserve hype and who played significant minutes last year, it's Jaquiel Marshall Ruddy. So I, I think the bar is higher. Than that, David. I, I agree. I, think the I, bar I, is... I disagree because that is based off his potential, which is great. That doesn't mean he's ready to change the game in MLS now. And I think you've seen players. I, come I out think. Like a I Gabe think. The, I was. think the bar for a successful season for him is to look like. You know, we're having this conversation at the end of the year, like who's the best young player in MLS, and he's one of one of the first three names we mentioned. That, yeah, like, I, to me, it's like a Kevin Predes esque breakout season. So I don't think Kevin, Kevin Predes wasn't had a, a starter breakout. his first year. He didn't have a breakout yeah. season. Kevin Predes had like so you a want, natural okay, progression. So, he, he, but that's right, my so, point. Like, that's he what I'm saying a about really good season. So, so for you, you want you want him to have like Kevin Predes last year. He played 1,500 minutes. He had three goals. He had one assist, and acquired, acquired obvious European interest. You think that's yeah. it? So I think I think Marshall Ruddy has to be a level higher than that. Interesting. This is that that's maybe the most interesting thing about this team to watch in the first six months. I mean, there are a lot of things. I, I think this Toronto team is actually fascinating. Mm. And we've used a lot of time talking about it and hit that buzzer right there. Okay, how about uh Ayo? What's uh what's uh, what what's what's a good season from Io, Dave? Give me a, give me your your like Boiled down Twitter answer on this one. Uh, I guess it would start with 2,500 minutes. Like, be healthy and play. That I, as much as the goals as we want to talk about, that has I, it wouldn't, to, wouldn't you be wouldn't you be happy with 2,000 minutes? Yeah, same. I, I, oh, can you afford that if you're Toronto FC? I mean, they just I guess that's the Jimenez. Got, that's a right? lot of minutes for Jesus Jimenez coming out of Poland or it's Luca Petrasso. I don't know. Maybe. Um, but I think the sentiment is is right, though, is that to stay healthy and to – if he's healthy, I think he'll be productive. Here's the over-under. Ten and a half combined goals and assists for Lorenzo Insigne. Half season, possible debut in the beginning of July sometime. Maybe even against Montreal, which would be awesome. Ten and a half feels low to me given – the talent level and the investment on combined goals and assists. We've seen other players come into this league and just, you know, Nico Ladero, Pipa Higuain, etc. light it on fire. Yeah, I but think even, you would, even you would Ryan be Gold, more. even Ryan Gold last year was fantastic. He only hit 10. He had four goals and six assists. I, I'm going to hit the under on that. I, I think there will be a, an adjustment for him, especially because he'll be coming off a full season without a full off season. He, he'll be prepping for the World Cups. So I, I think under 10 and a half. I think over because of the same reasons Doyle just said, which is uh, he has to hit form going into a World Cup. So he has to play at a high level. He has to push himself to get into fitness going into that tournament. And that means that he's not going to play in second gear. They're not going to sit him every other game. Like he has to get his legs back under him after what will probably be only a three, four week layoff in between seasons. Um, And if he's going to do that, then. If he's going to be on the field, you'd assume he'd be able to get five goals and six assists uh, with how good he can be. All right. Uh, this is fine meme. The big weakness or concern pitfall? Um, that they were a tire fire last year and without Insigne <laughs> to start the year. It's the same. Listen, Carlos Salcedo is obviously a massive upgrade. He's also not a guy that I look at that controls and marshals a back line. Now, maybe just having him in there brings back 
some of what Chris Mavinga was over the last few years because he doesn't have to cover for another player. But Salcedo take risks, takes risks. Um, and so if there is not complete solidity in that back line, you don't have cover in midfield for them. And you've had issues at goalkeeper as well with we don't even know who the two left backs will be and if they've ever even played or sorry, two fullbacks will be and if they play in MLS. So there's a really good chance that this team is kind of a mess to come out the gates and they could find their feet over the course of this year. uh, But that's probably not a, a formula for making the playoffs. So I think the, no. this, is, this is fine is is the midfield falls apart because there's not a di- not enough yep. defense there. And, and one of Osorio, Bradley, or, or, or Pozuelo has to be replaced. Um, I don't think this is a playoff team. I would agree. I just think there's too many holes right now. But uh, Bob Bradley surprised people before. Uh, Charlotte FC. Haiku 2022. How can you be screwed when you haven't played a minute? Ask the manager. So yeah, we're gonna play that one up uh, probably all year. It'll probably never go away. It's just so, it's just such a, a I good. I think it's a and liberal and use juicy. of the term "we." <laughs> you that's are fair. gonna play that one up all year. Yeah, so. that's fair. That's that's a good. That's a good. Yeah, that's a good. The key signings, the whole roster. Uh, so what what signings do you like, Doyle, for this expansion project? What are the what are the names uh, out there? That you're like, oh yeah, that's a good one. Good one. Uh, Give me like uh, three mean, or four names that you really like. Uh, I don't know if I could go that high. I, I'll, I'll say that you don't have three or four. I mean, Alcivar and, and and Franco, the, the the two Ecuador and central midfielders, on paper, they make a lot of sense. Um, like they 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 have the pedigree and, and the the profile of guys who can be pretty successful MLS players, uh, and that seems like a nice starting spot. I thought Anton Walks was pretty good last year. Um, I don't know he if he's a starter in MLS, but but he he was decent. Uh, I'll tell you what they they didn't they didn't make the choice with the number one overall super draft pick that I I would have made. I, so I, I you know I, I think that one's pretty tough. Um, I think they made two really good choices in the expansion draft in Ishmael Tajuri Shradi and Tristan Blackman. And they traded both those guys. Uh, You know, they burnt an international roster slot on a, on a, on a goalkeeper, uh, which it's all stuff that is like, it it raises some red flags. Uh, That said, um, I don't know, man. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a FC Cincinnati level disaster in the waiting. Uh, even though Miguel Angel Ramirez thinks otherwise, um, like they have, they're nominally too deep at every position. Like they didn't forget to get a backup demon, you know. <laughs> so it's like it, this could end up working out if the guys that they signed are um, as good as as they should be. Um, but also, like we're a week away from their debut, and their winger core is not inspiring any types of uh, uh, of optimism for for obvious reasons yeah they're not too deep there and at the 10 yeah, but- it's ben bender and then and then obviously christian ortiz well, so yeah it's ortiz that, it's, they that, cannot, i cannot imagine it's Bender. no no, no I'm they've, been too- playing or- they've been playing ortiz on the wing which right? is he's where he's played, played his a- whole career right he's a he's a playmaking winger and then they have probably franco and, and ruiz or bender as the co number eight in this four three three it'll look a little bit like austin's four three three last year but what they started with where it was two guys in front of a single pivot which it should actually- anyway I actually think it's a decent comp for them of Austin came out. They had a cohesive vision of what their team was. They just didn't have the talent uh, to win in MLS. And then they made that move later in the year. It wasn't enough to get in the playoffs. But right now they're a competitive playoff team because they brought Jerisi in. Um, And so I think that's probably the best case scenario for Charlotte. Clearly, they thought they had those guys available to them right now. And they've had two moves now fall apart. So it won't happen going into the season. It'll have to happen in the summer. But if you can show that your back five or back seven is stable, then that's a pretty good place to go from. Um, and if Swiderski shows that he can, you know, be a high level MLS forward, then you sort of give yourself that flexibility to wait and find the right guys out there that can be your 10 
or your go-to winger um, that they thought they had in Machis as well as the Polish winger that they had fall through. So based off their own view of their, their roster, they're not there, right? If you had two big time signings fall through and you haven't replaced them, they believe that talent doesn't exist, but it seems like they've built from the bottom or at least from the back forward. And that's a stable, smart way to not be FC Cincinnati. Uh, speaking of FC Cincinnati, I think one of us is, is there a March for that, uh, for that opening home game against the galaxy? I don't know. Uh, if if you there. see, if you see, you know, a, uh, people you look lookalike yeah. uh, in Charlotte uh, at that game, it is David Goss. You have booked your travel. You are. In, I'm going to their first for work. two games. I'm a Charlotte yeah, FC the, supporter. The TID man, you like? Yeah, I won't come on your I, podcast. Good point, Anders. Thank you for that. I would never, uh, but I will come to the game. <laughs> uh, I will be in buy DC a, for the opening. You like to buy him a beer? Yeah. I'll be in D.C. for the opening game for work, and then I'm going to Charlotte for fun because I think they said they're plus 65,000 on tickets now is the unofficial number um, that hasn't been updated. So I thought would be cooler than going to a sold out stadium to watch MLS. And I'm a huge Douglas Costa fan, so I had to get there. Yeah, look, but if he says something nice to you, just know that he's lying to your face. Not even. <laughs> just, he's just like, straight up, just a fake, yeah. just a complete fake. Uh, Karol Swiderski is our star spotlight. He's the first DP in club history, 25-year-old Polish forward, been in the national team, scored some goals, 60 goals in 263 career games, Doyle, coming over from the Greek League. He would seem to be a guy that would need, I mean, every forward needs service, but um, yeah, this could be a, this could be an interesting start for Carol. Yep. <laughs> um, from what we've seen from him, there's a level of mobility there, right? He'll come back, yep. he'll link up. He won't create, as you said, for himself, but he at least won't hang up top and wait, sort of like what we saw with Brenner over large portions of last season. Like, I think this will be a guy who, unfortunately, will be the central hub of your possession and your creativity. And then the question becomes, can anyone get their head down and get to the end line and pull balls back for him? And if you can do that, he'll be dangerous. He'll find his movement in the box, and he knows what to do once he gets in that position. There probably won't be a ton of that early on, but if he can be dangerous, then he can get you a couple of goals early in the season to give you some confidence to play off of. And you look at it, the fullback should be able to do that. Um, I wouldn't say Harrison Awful's in his prime anymore, uh, and we haven't seen a ton from Joseph Moore because of injury. But if those guys are in, or Jalen Lindsay, whatever it is, um, they're they're players who have shown that capability over the course of their MLS careers to at least create opportunities. Jordi Alcivar is our 22 under 22 player to watch. Got to have a good D mid in this league. Doyle, what do they need him to be? A good D mid in this league. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, if we want to go back to the to the uh, Austin comparison right because it does look like it'll be a a similar uh structure the thing that that just shredded austin last year was a lack of field coverage in central midfield they weren't able to to win the ball out of the scrums and they didn't get pressure to the opposition quickly in defensive transitions so that whoever was was first on the ball in the whatever midfield Austin was going against, they had time to pick their head up and pick their pass, and it was off to the races. Uh, Alcivar needs to be able to do a decent job of preventing those types of moments because if he doesn't, um, this could end up being like an Austin season or, or worse. Uh, our mailbag question is, uh, who do you think will be Charlotte's best, most important player in 2022? That's an interesting question, I think. We haven't mentioned one name that I, I think is going to be really crucial for them, Guzman Corujo, who's a Uruguayan center back over from Nacional, has a ton of experience in that league, and Libertadores and Sudamericana, etc. Uh, that one feels like uh, he and maybe like walks in that zone, and then Alcivar. Those guys feel like the ones that are likely to be the most important. Do you guys have any other names you want to throw out? Uh, I think the center back core has to, if, it, if it's not Guzman, it's um, Shobinski or Christian McCoon, whoever it is, you need to have that established piece in your team. And then Doyle mentioned they brought in an international goalkeeper, which is not normally how you'd prefer to build a roster. But if he's good, then it's a solid foundation for your team. Maybe you going to say Christian Fuchs? No. Who do you think is going to have the C? 
Feels like he would be a candidate to. I mean, it, it seems if like he's on, if he's in the team. The he's thirty five. Yeah, he's he, yeah, I think he was he, already he, already injured. Maybe. I thought he, I read that. I don't know. Yeah. I thought I read that, but he came off a game injured. I, I don't know. He was like he was decent in the USL last year, but like just decent. His first game ever was against Red Bull too, and he got bodied by my boy Omar. So <laughs> watch out. <laughs> over under 40 and a half points that would mean they are out of the playoffs but they're at least sneaking around i'm gonna go under on 40 and a half under That's Un- okay good. here we go over or under wooden spoons owned by Sin- or by charlotte at the end of this year 0. 0.5 <laughs> uh, 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 i'll go i'll go under <laughs> on that one <laughs> I'll say that someone else will I mean, be worse. Uh, I was say, I mean, come on, Cincinnati hasn't done that much to to push themselves out of spoon territory. You know, like they had twenty, they had they averaged almost just barely more than half a point a game last year. I would say under on that as well. I think they find a way out, uh, but it's going to be a competition, certainly at the bottom, to see who takes who drew that one the on. Line at forty point five. I don't know. That must have been under Charlotte. Who, here's here's teams that here's are teams they, that were who, under. Who are, they, are they signing Mbappe and Allen this summer? <laughs> like, how do you get to forty point five <laughs> points for this the team? Teams under forty and a half last year were Chicago at thirty four, Toronto at twenty eight, Cincinnati again at twenty. In the Western Conference, uh, it was Dallas, Austin, and Houston, the entire state of Texas, rolling in under 40 points. So, yeah, that that finishes us up here. I think that this is fine meme is the big concern. Weakness pick falls. They don't have the talent, and they don't, they're don't. they not able to integrate that talent in time, and therefore they are uh, in that Austin territory of like around 30 points or competing for the, a spoon. This is fine meme, though, is the talent defensively. I think we can all safely say they don't have the talent in the attack right now. If it comes to be well, that's the that's the why this could, this could be their year, not why no, this is no. fine because this is fine as like things are burning. No, but around I'm me. saying if they don't have the talent defensively, the players they actually meant to bring in and where uh, they built, yes. then it's a train wreck. If those players are fine, then they'll be competitive. They'll be in games. But that's the this is fine meme is that all of the pieces that they felt good about in defensive midfield and along the back line they were wrong about because Zoran Cornetta. It, what you're hoping on this team is that his pulse for talent around the world, the, the finger he has on the pulse around the world, is good. Because if not, none of these dudes have played in MLS. And you don't have a ton to fall back on if it turns out that they're not up to the level of this league. Yeah, sort of seems like Charlotte's in a situation right now, at least. I mean, again, depending on your words, you could say screwed, but I didn't. Um, that, you know, it's kind of like, it's a, this is fine meme. Either they're going to be surrounded by fire or they're going to be engulfed in it. We don't know which one. <laughs> It's going to be just yet. All right, that's it. 28 teams. I kind of feel like all the ones we did way back, you I know, like a month ago, it. are just completely irrelevant. Yeah, well, like, everyone's signed. Just, <laughs> things have changed so much. So, like, if we did your team way back at the beginning, just know that you can't hold us accountable for literally anything we said. Do you want to uh, do you want to make today's show twelve hours? We'll just go back and we'll do the the <laughs> first do uh, all, twenty teams do them all again. again? <laughs> yeah. uh, why not? Why not? Let's uh, finish up our top fives. How about that? Number nines. So uh, I think while you were gone pre-show, Doyle, we might have switched some things around here. So feel free to, uh, you know, speak or if you want to, hold your peace here. Uh, number five, Chicharito. Number four, Adam Buxa, who, Doyle, you had higher, but we moved mm-hmm. down. Number three, Joseph Martinez. Number two, Raul Ruiz Diaz. And number one, Tati. How do you feel about this list uh, in retrospect after some chops and changes from the uh, pull up bureau here, Doyle. I, I think it's the I think it's the right five center forwards. Um, you know, based upon what they did last year, what we can expect from them this year, uh, all around impact on the game. I like. I'm fine. I had Books a higher. I, I think he still has another level that he can hit, and I, I'm kind of expecting that this year. So I had him number two. Um, I. But like other than that, it's 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 fine. Like these are these are the five guys. That said, there are there are some guys who can maybe yeah. push in this year. Uh, Gon- Gonzalo Higuain could get in here. I mean, if things you know, look, they, they may not be great, but he might be personally great. Brian White, he of the hat trick in the preseason and many a um, um, 
fun moment for the Whitecaps. He could Andiamo his way up, uh, I don't know, into more of a contention on this list. Gustavo Bo sort of like lies in that Demir Krylock zone yeah. we talked about last time where it's like, oh man, we don't really have a very snug fit for them, but they would be in a top five of whatever category you want to drop them into, like second forwards or whatever it is. Jeremy Abobasi could be poised for a big season. I like that. That's an interesting one. Uh, Io, we already talked about uh, Chicho Arango. LAFC fans are like, "What the hell? Are you come on? How are you going to have Chicho in here? Going to get twenty-seven penalties again? Is, is that how he's? I mean, with if Vela's healthy, he might. Yeah, actually, well, he's not taking them. <laughs> yeah, he healthy. wouldn't take them. <laughs> yeah, that's the unfortunate thing for him. Giassi's artist, you, maybe a bounce back season from Giassi. Any other names? Oh, there's a bunch of Dave. There's a bunch of guys that we yeah. just didn't know how to. I rank. put the list. I, I think it was five. You've got a DP center forward signing in Philly, in Orlando, two in Houston, two in Philly. That's right. Um, I think those are all names where you can't feel strong enough about it preseason, but all of them, if they're able to hit the ground running, could be in this conversation. This guy that SKC brought in as well that we discussed in the open. If you know, if you can find your feet and score 15 goals in this league, you can push into that combo. I think Mason Toy should be mentioned as well. Okay, so if he's I, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you. Then I'm going to I'm going to give you a question that I think you're really going to like. Uh-oh. Which which domestic center forward is most likely to push into this? Out of the group is Mason Toy in Montreal, Io up in Toronto, Brian White in uh, Vancouver, Jeremy Abobasi in San Jose, and uh, Miguel Berry in Columbus. I'll say Mason Toy. Um, yeah. Of all of those, I think... I'm going Tom Barlow. <laughs> I th- <laughs> no, I think Toy showed last year that if he had stayed healthy, he would be in that combo. And seven goals in nine hundred minutes. Seven goals in nine hundred minutes. And for Mason Toy. you're probably talking about the best team of all those teams, right? Where it's, if Boba sees a better player, San Jose, I don't know that they'll have enough around him. Um, Io as well with the conversation we just had, and I don't think Miguel Barry will be the starter. Uh, in Columbus, especially yeah. World Cup year. If you think Columbus will be improved from last year, that means Zardes is getting chances that people are creating for him. Um, so I, I put it to Brian White and Mason Toy, and I think it'll be Toy. I'm going to go with Jesus Ferreira. Oh, I left Jesus out. Yeah. You left Jesus yeah, out. I, I, yeah. I just don't think of him as the number nine. That's my bad. Yeah. So well, if we it's, add... It's a false, he's like a false nine. <laughs> right, but, you know, right. like, whatever it might if be. We add, you want to talk about If it. we add Jesus Ferreira to, to that list, does that change your reckoning, David? No, I still go Toy. So okay. let I me think, ask you one more thing. I think Jesus thing. is going to I think Jesus is going to have let me put the over under how would I put the over under on goals and assists combined at 18 and a half. I would go under. For Jesus Ferreira? Yeah. 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 I'll go He under was right there last shade. year. Yeah. Yeah, he was 9 and 9 and 8 last year. Something like that. Yeah, he was right there. 10. Yeah. I'm still no going to go under. Okay. Just saying. Just throwing it out there. Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you, Diff. No, you interrupted Joy. I thought you were, but I don't know what yeah. his question is. Oh, I was I was gonna say, what are the chances what are the chances that at the end of the year US national team fans are just like pulling their hair out that Io Akinola chose Canada over the US? Pretty decent, right? Yeah. Probably like, pretty yeah. If, if he stays healthy, if he stays healthy, he's nasty. especially be, especially because then he's like so he's like down he, like They'll have like five dudes. Oh, he won't yeah. even. We I didn't, don't even know that he'll make the even, Canada roster. Yeah. That's what yes. I'm saying. We didn't, we didn't, like, we didn't even talk can, about he, Cavallini he, hardly at all with Vancouver. Like, he if, could if, score. If the U.S. had Io Cavallini score right now, we might be starting and still him. still miss that team. Yeah. Like, I, it's I, crazy, I, man. Like, yeah. A lot of talent. All right. That's it for our team by team season previews. We'll be back on Monday, recorded Friday again. So we'll, we'll hit you up for uh, award candidates, et cetera. We'll do our individual award predictions for Monday. And then that will also, the Golden Boot Draft uh, will also be a part of that, which I'm greatly looking forward to this year to try to make up for my utter failure. Who last won year. last year? Uh, and, we never calculated uh, it. Did you win? And I don't, I don't know. know, but I did picked, you win? And that's I like think a I picked, facetious question. No, I picked Rui Diaz, him? but I don't know who my other pick was, so I don't remember. I feel like Kalen might have won. I don't know. Uh, Anders, Anders says he has it. He'll Are you ready it for out. We'll, the we'll, mailbag? Yeah, we'll reveal it. Oh, and by the way, Thursday we'll do our, uh, our big. Week one preview, as well as our team previews. And this year we're introducing a new concept, which is the trophy draft. So we are going to go through and draft every single team. Every team. Uh, and you, and whoever, every team, all 28. And whoever has the most trophies oh at the end God. of the year uh, and the wins spoon, that one. And the wooden spoon counts as a trophy. Should it count? 
It should. Do I get? Absolutely. I think it should count. I think it should count because that'll make those middle picks really interesting where you're like, yeah. oh, they win, and then, and then somebody jumps in and they're like, FC Cincinnati, baby. <laughs> Let's go for pick. Pete. For <laughs> Pete. Can I pick PSG? Is that an option? Mm, okay. No. It's MLS team. So. <sighs> All right. Let's do the mailbag and get All out right. of here. 401 206 MLS. Extra time mail soccer.com. Good friend of the show, Jason in DC, says From the end of MLS Cup, presented by Audi, like that, to the first game of the Scotiabank CONCACAF Champions oh, God, League. So great sponsor. There's a void for MLS fans. Do you think for those two and a half months, there's room for an MLS Legends tournament presented by Tiger Bomb? Question mark. There oh, have to yes. be enough veteran legendary players to fill six teams, right? Is there any chance MLS or AARP can make this happen? I love this. I also love the fact that he threw in the tiger yeah. bomb there. Back in the day, back in the day, high, high school baseball days, we used to just lather that up in every but in high school classrooms. Everybody hated yeah, us. It smells like it smells horrid. Uh, I love this. How would we do it? We can't do a full field, right? Five like that's aside, not entertaining. Yeah, five aside. Yeah, five it, would aside. Like, it would be like the big three. Who would be right? our captain? Like, what do you do? Ever... Who are your captains? So we need who are our captains? Six teams. Can we can we pull in like current can coaches current coaches get pulled into this as captains etc or does it have to be like retired but not do right. anything and how old do I'm gonna they go have to be? I'm gonna go if first AR, two picks if off AARP is involved I'm going first two picks off the back because we be talking too much I'm going D Row and Jimmy Conrad as two captains I think they would both be into it I think they both can still play. And I think they'd both be good part of this. So those are my first two. I actually don't know that the ability to still play matters that much to me. Like, I, I almost want to see the opposite uh, of just, <laughs> you know, legends who are just so far past it but still having a good time. Let's see. Captains. If we're going captains that could still play, I feel like Eddie Pope could just run people over still, I'm sure. I know that he hasn't let himself go, so I'd love to see that one. Uh, Clint Mathis would be fun. I think he's on maybe the opposite end of but the spectrum. But he'll still score goals. Right doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Get him anywhere near I like the ball. That. I like that. I like that. Uh, Marco would be a fun one to have in there. Mm-hmm. Marco Echeverry would be a good one. Who you got, Doyle? You're the, you're the, like the old school MLS, you know, memory bank here. Yeah, I don't know. I lost interest. Nice. Let's move on to the Doyle's okay, team would start it. with Joel yeah. Pair. Everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> he basically puts a, anything else. He would just put together Hans Baca's team. That's what Doyle would do. I would. Are we having? Uh, are we having DJ Soli like uh, out yeah, there? Because if it's like five aside, we need to have a party going sure. on. So we get DJ Soli out there. Dave that Vandenberg. Could be fun. What a squad! Oh. I think he's an assistant yeah, coach. Killer squad. In New England. <laughs> uh, anything else in here? Yeah. Are we are we done and, no, and dusted here? Go. That's it from us. All right. Have a uh, have a great week, everybody. That's it for us. Well, no, that's weekend coming up. Mm, well. Yeah, we'll see you on Monday. That's it for us. Adios. Season almost here. Enjoy CCL. Smooth extra. Smooth. Congratulations. You made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.